The 6.5 is on the road with a view from Davos. We're having great conversations here. You know, World Economic Forum is really a unique event, a melding of technology, governments, regulation, a lot of discussion about uh, sustainability. And of course, I think at least for us, the headliner here has been about uh, AI. Yeah, we knew that coming here, this was gonna be sort of an inflection year. A lot of the research that we're all doing on our side of the house is looking at, okay, we've had these kind of infrastructure boons over the last couple of years, but now we gotta figure out how to implement this stuff, start to derive value, how do governments get value, enterprises get value. And then of course, in Davos here, you're gonna have that challenge of how do we keep building AI at this scale and address the energy needs? That's right, it is, is definitely a balance. I mean, engineering, you need a lot of engineering to go in there and get the right balance uh, to deliver that enterprise value for AI. So I'd like to bring in Antonio Neri, Great to see you again. Welcome back to the 6.5. Yeah, thank you for having me. Welcome to Davos, an amazing place and an interesting time. It is an amazing place and, and HPE is multinational provider uh, to businesses, but a lot of governments. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you guys coined Edge to Cloud and you, you were right. And now we, you know, I think we're all, every, the industry believes that hybrid AI is the way to go. but. More importantly, generally, what do you like to achieve in the show? What are your objectives here? Well, as always, uh, is a good uh, opportunity to uh, check in. You know, every twelve months, coming here and uh, meet our customers. You know, pretty much all of them are here, right? And also uh, key government officials to understand their agendas, their objectives. And as you said, you know, AI is top of agenda for all governments because they have to control the destiny with this amazing technology. So for me, it's an opportunity to connect with everyone in one place right. over a three, uh, three days period. So logistically, it makes it very, very easy, but also to tell our story. And HP has a unique point of view when it comes down to some of these technologies and what they can do for business, but also for society. And uh, I think, you know, people are realizing that Companies like HP, who has been investing over the years, you know, in hybrid cloud, in AI at scale, in networking, in making sure these technologies equitable, accessible, inclusive, and sustainable. Right. These are messages that resonate here. Makes sense. Yeah, Antonio, it feels good to be right occasionally. And, you know, I think both of us can say we really did see what you were doing early on with GreenLake. We both were believers. And I still really do believe, I actually think as companies are starting to see the cost of doing AI. Yeah. Um, you know, you heard me in the kind of beginning talking about deriving value. Yeah. I mean, you seem to be in such a good position right now between what you're doing on the compute side, your partnership with NVIDIA, the Juniper deal, and now the, the networking scale that you're able to offer. How is it kind of coming together? Because all this infrastructure investment has to start to bear fruit. Yeah. Um, I imagine a lot of the conversations you're having here are about that. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you guys have been uh, great advocates of what we've been doing, but also be able to tell it in a way that people understand, both from a business and a technology perspective. And it takes a unique set of skills because sometimes you can be very technology oriented or very high level and then people don't connect the dots. But I will say uh, our strategy has been consistent and curated over the almost seven years I've been as a CEO. And each component is a building block for the next one. And when I think about preparing us for this moment. Uh, you know, we said seven years ago, the enterprise of the future will be edge-centric, cloud-enabled, and data-driven. That gave us the vision to build an edge-to-cloud experience and architecture underneath. Right. And, uh, you know, that starts with the networking. And uh, we start the first at the edge with the campus and branch and IoT and private 5G. And we were very successful uh, with that. But now with the Juniper, we complement that to the cloud and inclusive of the service providers. And I believe that's the core foundation of what Hewlett Packard will look like once the transaction closes. That's the core tenant for, by which you can deliver these hybrid experiences, whether it's cloud or AI. You need hybrid cloud to deliver on hybrid AI. And that's true, particularly for enterprises, which have data everywhere. But then when you go to the AI, it's not created equal, right? So you have people that are you know, racing to build these models at massive scale, although we are moving to what are more a mix of experts and uh, more agentic type of approaches to st stitch together the best model, to deliver the best outcome for a specific task for a workflow. That's true for enterprise, but these companies are in the business to build these models. 
and they need an enormous amount of computational power. And for them, it's all about cost, scalability, and sustainability. And HP has a unique point of view when it comes down to that, because we are the market leader in supercomputing. And we have, you know, shown the last uh, 18 months, you know, some of the amazing systems, including 10 days ago with the El Capitan and Billy, the largest uh, supercomputer ever built. But then when you go to enterprise, that's a different story. And you guys understand that it's all about simplicity of deployment and adoption. And that's where the partnership model is important. But our technology and our platform, GreenLake, is a core tenant of that. And now we have more than 40,000 customers that give us the ability to allow them to go from, whether it's deployed networking or just cloud and hybrid cloud, to going through AI. And that's why we conceive our offer to be so simple in three clicks and less than 30 seconds to deploy. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations here about uh, sovereign AI clouds. Yes. And you know, you have the easy button where it can be a full stack of HPE. Uh, you can mix and match uh, with your partner, particularly on the software side. Uh, question, there's been a lot of action, obviously, in hyperscaler, the training of it. Uh, what's your what's your sense uh, from the conversations here, uh, but also for the last couple of months on the timing of let's say the surge of of government AI and, and enterprise AI? I mean, it's starting. Uh, the curve is swift, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still a little bit in its infancy. It is. But uh, in fact, uh, after this interview, I'm going to meet a few governments that are thinking about deploying sovereign AI clouds. And uh, we're just warming you up. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but again, when I think about AI, think about the segmentation of AI. There is three key segments in my mind. There is the model builders and the hyperscalers and the service providers alike. They are in the business to either build a model, train the model, or provide large infrastructure for people to do their own experimentation, or in some cases, just do inferencing. Uh, and that's, think about in that space, maybe, you know, 10, 20 customers, large CapEx deployments in the tens of billions of dollars, they soon will be consuming million GPUs. They already are in the tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands. Uh, and that's what a lot of the action is today, because there is the race to continue to make this model better and then uh, more accurate. And then obviously there is a proliferation of these models, like we said before. Then you have the uh, service providers that either are there to fulfill a need with enterprises on co-locations and hosting, or some of them to provide capacity to these model builders because they don't have enough. Right. Um, but also, many of them actually are in the business to provide a sovereign cloud. However, the second segment is this sovereign AI. And I think there are 15 countries that are taking the lead. Obviously, United States, States is one. In Europe, you know, think about uh, UK, France, Germany. In the last six months, you know, we have seen more action there. You know, last week we opened the HLRS system in uh, Munich. Um, you know, we are building the UK Bristol, which is the UK uh, AI cloud. We are building the uh, Japan AI ST for Japan. And then now Middle East is very active, right? Both the Saudi and the UAE, and obviously we're talking here with both of them, including the G42 entity with a lot of CapEx available and energy available, which is very important. So I think they are, you know, think about three different curves. One very steep, both consumption and speed. The other one is ramping up fast. And then you have the enterprise. By the way, on the sovereign, it will be tens of thousands of GPUs at the time, deployments. Uh, but when you go to enterprise, there will be hundreds of thousands of customers, but they deployed that's very small, right. maybe hundreds of GPUs, because they are in the business to do a ragging or just uh, fine tuning. And that's where I'm very excited because over time, that's where the value is. He talked about early on, it's all great, but in the end it has to deliver value, uh, whether it's productivity or differentiation. And I believe that's where ultimately we will achieve the full potential. And then with governments, obviously, to make sure they address the needs culturally in the geo, and then fundamentally to provide better services to their citizens. Makes sense. So Antonio, um, just a couple of minutes left here. Um, it's an exciting day. We're actually launching the largest CEO research panel of its uh, of its kind about AI. We talked yeah. to 213 CEOs that run companies over a billion of revenue. 
and we asked them about AI. You've always been very culture driven in your company. One of the interesting findings was 80% of companies where CEOs are driving the AI initiative are getting less value than they are when they actually properly. I guess I'm just kind of curious, what mm -hmm. kind of advice do you give given that you're involved with so many enterprises, so many governments, what kind of advice are you giving to the market about success with AI now that you're really getting into the into the meat of seeing these companies being able to de deliver? Well, first of all, you, you have to be on the loop uh, as soon as you can, because otherwise you're going to be left behind. Second, you have to have a culture of fail fast and improve. The reality, you're not going to figure all this out immediately. You're going to have some quick wins and a lot of failures, but the failures are important to learn and then, you know, improve the next cycle. And you have to have this culture of uh, iterative, you know, until we get the right balance of doing the right thing, which obviously responsibility, inclusion, and all those are core values are important with the business results, right? And um, I think, you know, I have to think about AI is less about the technology, it's more about the business. And everybody plays a role in the entire enterprise. You know, in our case, we have a, a group of people that drive the steering team for us. We have more than 250 cases that we go through the process. Some of them are in full production. Some of them are in ideation. Some already already failed and said, right. okay, forget it, you know, move on. And so I think that's what you have to establish. And I think that's an opportunity in my mind for every enterprise to rethink the culture of the company because it's not the technology, it's how you do business going forward. And I think this technology allows you to really take a step back, reimagine your enterprise using these technologies in the ways that we haven't imagined before. But again, if you don't get on that train, you're gonna be left behind. And that's a problem, right? Because we saw that when people went through the COVID, you know, those who were ahead on the digital transformation and they had digital processes in place, they were able to move quickly, you know, in, in adopting, you know, whatever they needed to be done, you know, working from home or, or engaging customers in, you know, in digital interactions, you know, and that's, that's what's going to happen here. AI is going to drive a lot of those interactions on that digital platform. Antonio, great insights as always. Thanks so much for spending a little time with the 6.5 with Pat and I here. Appreciate uh, your, uh, your friendship and we appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, at HPA. And thank you for coming here and covering the event. I think you bring a unique point of view and trying to make it simple for people to understand Thank you. Uh, what happens here, because sometimes, you know, they think this is a big political thing, actually is way more than that. I think is uh, the intersection of social issues with technology and governmental agendas that ultimately, when the right focus is in place, a lot of things can happen. Big so thank you. And public partnership. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining the 6.5 On The Road with a view from Davos. Hit subscribe. Join us for all of the content here on the ground at Davos 2025, the World Economic Forum. Patrick, you gotta say goodbye now. See y'all later.